When robot makers look at nature, biology and engineering find their meeting point, creating a new class of efficient and versatile robotic systems inspired by plants, animals and insects. Recreating life with a robot can be a great tool for scientific discovery. Robots can learn a lot from nature. Swarming behavior, for instance, can lead to the development of more flexible and adaptive robotic systems. By building robots that mimic um, biological systems, we can better understand biological systems. Tomorrow's robots are not robots. They are living machines. The future of robotics will beat a path through the natural world. Let's discover the best in Europe's bio-inspired robots. Mankind has always looked at nature to solve complex problems, taking a cue from the brilliant solutions that biological systems have refined through natural selection. This process is called biomimetics and has been used to kickstart several key technologies, like flight. Now it's the turn of robot makers, who are not trying to copy nature directly, but to recreate some of its inner workings and mechanics to create a new class of artificial systems bio-inspired robots. Europe is now a leading force in all fields of robotics, but it seems to be particularly interested in what nature has to offer. A significant portion of ongoing projects, effort and investments are related to bio-inspired robotics. Japanese robotics it's kind of aimed at building the perfect nurse. And American robotics, as a stereotype, trying to build the perfect Terminator. But what is European robotics? And here one is struggling somewhat to find the common denominator, but it seems to have something to do with capturing the essence of some soft, embodied, organic substance that is harmless and nice and it's not so much focus on the hard abstract thing or the powerful actuators, but something that could blend in with the human experience. And nothing can blend with human experience more smoothly than what already exists in nature. Animals and insects have always been a model for engineers who are interested in locomotion. But a new source of inspiration in this field could come from an unexpected source, plants. At the Pontedera branch of the Italian Institute of Technology in Tuscany, we meet the world's first robotic plant called Plantoid. Plantoid is the first robot inspired by plants and specifically by plant roots. What is interesting for us is to study the strategies implemented by roots and specifically by their tips to uh, penetrate efficiently the soil. And there are many features that we want to investigate in plants. Uh, for example, few people know that plants move in a very efficient way, usually in a different time scale with respect to the most animals. What is, what is very interesting in plant roots is that in order to move from one point to, the, to another, they have to grow. And this means that they continuously adapt their morphology to the changing condition the environment. And our goal is to investigate, investigate all these strategies in plant roots in order to translate these features in new robotic solutions. Just like a real root, plantoid grows by adding material at its tip, and it also produces lateral hairs that it uses to anchor itself, reducing the effort needed to penetrate the soil. 
a completely new strategy that could give rise to a revolutionary class of robot. Our goal is to develop a plant-inspired robots that can be useful for environmental monitoring. Imagine larger areas with several plantoids that instead to move on the surface, move underground, looking for different parameters depending from the sensor that we integrate in the tips, so we can look for heavy metals or radon or simply water. But we want to go beyond this scenario and use the inspiration to plant roots in order to develop a new uh, solution in medical robotics, so to develop new endoscopes that are able to grow and to bend the human domains, for example in brain. In this way, the robot, the endoscope, can move in the brain without the friction, without the damage for the tissue, opening new scenario in medical robotics. But Plantoid's features make it potentially interesting for even more ambitious scenarios, like space exploration. Plantoids can be also used for, for space application. The idea is to use a plantoid uh, in other planets, not only on Earth, to uh, look again for water or other parameters. What is interesting in space application is also not only the uh, capability of exploring soil and uh, uh, new environment, but also the capability that plants have to anchor the structure before growing. And this is very interesting for space application too. This would allow it to overcome one of the most taxing challenges for a spacefaring robot, locomotion. Moving about on the surface of another planet in very hostile environmental conditions is extremely complicated and requires a lot of energy. But machines with roots would no longer need to move around. They would substitute mobility with communication and shared intelligence. Taking inspiration by plant roots uh, is not only interesting for developing new growing robots, but also for developing new algorithms inspired by the root tips that it seems able to communicate each other in order to be more efficient in the soil exploration. And this research is performing together with APFL in Lausanne and specifically with Professor Dario Floriano. We use a process uh, of artificial evolution, so we mimic natural evolution in a sense in a computer, to automatically develop the control system of simulated roots that allow the plant to find the nutrients in the ground. After this evolutionary process, which takes place uh, in the computer and simulates many generations of evolution of these simulated plants, we end up with a control system for the simulated roots that allow the plant to find the nutrient um, in the simulated ground. And uh, this not only provides the control system for the robot, so allows the robot to control the roots and penetrate the ground, but also provides an hypothesis for how the biological roots could actually explore the, the soil, which is something we, which is still uh, largely unknown. This type of collective behavior and communication is based on the swarm concept, which is extremely widespread in nature and could be successfully applied to robots as well. There are many examples of uh, swarm intelligence in nature where an individual, a relatively simple individual, can benefit from the intelligence of the group. One of these is uh, division of labor in ants. You have ant colonies that uh, specialize uh, groups of individuals for specific tasks depending on the demand of the task. And the decision of how an individual specializes for a specific task is uh, given only by local information. What the surrounding individuals do and how much nutrient or enemies are at that location. And the rules of the local adjustment to one task or the other gives a coordinated global behavior that satisfies all the needs of the economy. Swarm behavior is something we see everywhere in nature. You know, it's really about animals coming together in a decentralized way and doing something together. And that can have great applications in robotics. Because what you can do, instead of having a big machine performing some complex tasks, 
you can have many smaller machines performing little tasks but in sync, and that becomes much more effective. In aerial robotics, for example, swarm intelligence leads to the creation of very simple and cost-effective drones, like these flying over the campus of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. They can survey large areas using shared intelligence, with dramatically better efficiency than a single, more sophisticated flying robot. And they don't necessarily have to look like small airplanes. At the University of Delft in the Netherlands, we find small winged robots that fly and share information just like real insects do. I want uh, the little artificial insects to talk to each other like real insects with pheromones, only not with chemical pheromones but with radio signals, uh, which means that every little robot would have a radio receiver and transmitter and they can understand, they can measure the field strength that's coming from the other robots so then they know the distance. And I can tell them not to be too close to each other and not to be too far away. And that way they form a consistent swarm to do exploration for me. These robots are designed to explore unknown or difficult environments, like the surface of extraterrestrial planets such as Mars. But this model of distributed intelligence can be put to good use here on Earth as well. If you look at uh, applications on Earth, then we would also look at what do insects do and can we do that uh, too. And one of the examples uh, could be if you have a large warehouse with fruit that is getting ripe, then you want to know where the ripe fruit is. You can have these little flapping wing UAVs fly around with a sensor that can sense the gas that is expelled by ripe fruit. Uh, and when they fly around, they will actually find the ripe fruit for you and they will sit there and point to owner where the fruit is. In principle, they do the same thing as a fruit fly does, but the only difference is that uh, this fly will not eat your fruit. One of the major challenges in aerial robotics is the risk of collision. Flying robots can fall to the ground and sustain critical damage. But looking at insects, roboticists are now developing machines that can withstand impacts. How? thanks to an exoskeleton, which can absorb the force of the collision without suffering any damage, just like a fly that bumps into a window pane and then veers off unscathed. The first prototype of a collision-resilient flying robot is the airbore. The airbore is a star-shaped structure, which allows it to withstand very strong collisions against the wall and fall on the ground and then fly again. The, the airbird doesn't need sophisticated sensors and sophisticated artificial intelligence to explore a room. It will keep flying and colliding, and as it does so, it collects information about the size of the room and the empty space. The second prototype of a collision-resilient flying robot is the gimbal. The gimbal is a sphere. It's made of uh, two concentric spheres, one inside the other, that can freely rotate. And this allows the robot to fly in a very cluttered environment, collide with obstacles and absorbs the collision thanks to the external cage, while at the same time the internal sphere can maintain a perfect attitude. That means that we can put a camera within the robot, we can fly it in very complex environment, withstand a lot of collision and the camera within the inner sphere will always remain stable. This is the ultimate explorer robot. It can go anywhere. It can roll downstairs, it can fly across space, it can collide with walls, it can fly in forest and always allow you a very stable vision of what is surrounding it. Because they have the ability to map the environment without worrying about bumping into obstacles, these robots can be very useful in search and rescue operations. And they can operate both indoors and outdoors, and even in tight spaces, like a building that's collapsed or has been damaged by a quake. When considering indoor flight, though, drone makers also have to take into account a different type of obstacle. A major challenge in flying robotics is to stabilize the flight. If we fly outdoor, it is not a problem because we have a GPS signal. If we fly indoor, we don't have GPS. So how can we do that? We can go to nature and see how insects solve this problem. Insects solve the problem in two ways. They use vision and they use accelerations that they can experience using special sensors. We have reproduced uh, this system, the system used by insects, with this small robot. What we do is that we use many small eyes 
that point in different directions and collectively they operate like the compound eye of an insect and we use uh, accelerometers which are specific sensors within the robot. By fusing together the information just like we think insects do, we can fly this small 30 gram quadrotor perfectly uh, stable in any indoor environment. This ultralight flying robot is called Bionicopter and it also uses an array of sensors to stabilize its flight. It's made by German automation company Festo and its shape is modeled on the dragonfly, even though its length of 63 centimeters makes it look like a giant prehistoric insect. It has two pairs of wings, which enable it to fly in any direction and to hover in midair. The wings have carbon fiber frames wrapped in a polyester membrane while the main body is made from a flexible plastic polymer. Inside the body, there are nine servo motors, the battery, inertia sensors, and a microprocessor. This controls the flapping frequency and the tilt of the wings, which determines the direction of thrust. The Bionicopter is easily controlled via a smartphone. The operator just selects the direction of flight, while onboard systems take care of everything else through continuous data acquisition and diagnostics in real time. Unlike a helicopter, this robotic insect does not need to tilt forwards to generate forward thrust. This enables it to fly horizontally as well as float like a glider. Overall, the Bionicopter weighs just 175 grams and could lead to the production of advanced indoor and outdoor reconnaissance drones, while at the same time unearthing the secrets of the Dragonfly's flight. At the Biorobotics Institute of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, Italy, we find another robot that attempts to recreate a unique feature of an insect, the jump of a cricket. Our small robot, a jumping robot, is inspired by a tiny insect called a cicadella, which is similar in fact to a cricket but shorter, smaller in size. And uh, its characteristic is to be able to jump and to overcome obstacles that are higher with respect to the sides of the system. This allows to monitor, maybe by using a number of those robots, not just one, an area that is uneven and uh, also for exploring uh, corners that are small with respect to human uh, operators, for example. Jumping may seem like an awkward and energy-hungry locomotion mechanism, but the mass of an insect is very tiny compared to its muscular power, and that is what makes it viable. Why jumping with respect to other locomotion strategies? Because with jumping, thanks to the aerial phase, it is possible to overcome obstacles and also to travel long distances. This is similar, in fact, to flight, with a uh, difference, a main difference concerning energy. Uh, while flying, for observing a scene, it is necessary to provide energy for hovering. While with jumping, it is possible to stay on the ground and to rest without spending energy, in fact. The fine motor skills of insects, especially when dealing with rough or uneven terrain, are also a source of inspiration for Zebro, a six-legged robot developed at the University of Delft. It's designed to investigate new robotic locomotion mechanisms, and thanks to its peculiar morphology, it can even flip over and keep moving. Search and rescue robots nowadays mostly use tracks or wheels. We decide to follow a different approach. We use legs, and there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, uh, with legs, you're more flexible where you interact with the ground, and this allows you to overcome more different classes of obstacles. Six legs are a very interesting morphology for locomotion, because you have always three legs in the ground simultaneously, and that makes a triangle which is very stable.
but nature showcases even more astonishing ways to move around, which they're trying to replicate at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich by leaving this robot literally hanging by a thread. We are building a robot that is inspired by spiders. So the focus of this robot is not how the spider walk on the ground, which you see in the past in robots, but rather how the spider this robot could uh, mimic the, the behavior of a spider that makes the drag lines or webs and in order to move from an environment, solid environment, into an empty space. So um, the robot shown here uh, is uh, 170 gram in body mass and can make drag lines at the moment uh, with a diameter from 1 mm to 5 mm and reach a speed of about over just over 10 cm per minute. And in the future, we want this robot to extend this robot such that the robot can make webs and move along uh, around uh, using the webs. As well as recreating the morphology of insects' bodies and some aspects of their physiology, robot makers are also trying to replicate the functions and the anatomy of specific organs, as with this artificial eye called Curvace. Curvis is a radically new type of camera. It is inspired upon the compound eye of uh, insects. It is made of several hundred small cameras, each pointing in a different direction. Each of these small cameras is uh, sensitive to movement. And the collective combination of all these movement information across the camera, across the compound eye, allows the system to detect uh, distance from objects. Even though it's about 10 times larger than the eye of the fruit fly it's derived from, Curvace has the same photoreceptor density, the same image resolution, and the same response time to brightness changes. But it's also a hundred times faster than the insect equivalent. And at just one millimeter in thickness, it lends itself to a variety of applications where accurately measuring the distance from a moving object is essential. Natural and artificial compound eyes are very good for detecting motion and detecting distances to objects. And uh, just like for insects, compound eyes are used for stabilizing the flight in space and judging how far away the different obstacles are. Artificial compound eyes could find an application in cars, for example, to enable the car to detect the distances from other cars or to detect the distance from the edge of the road, or could also be used for medical devices. For example, we can imagine an endoscope with a small compound eye at the tip that can tell exactly how far it's moving in the body. Or we can even imagine to have a small compound eye sewed into the t-shirt of a kid to enable the kid to perceive incoming cars from the back, thanks to a sound of an alert system, for example. Building robots that are so closely related to a natural counterpart could give birth to an entirely new concept in artificial systems. Tomorrow's robots are not robots. They are living machines. But can we really call a robot a living machine? I think it's difficult to assign the term living to a machine because living implies a system with certain properties that a lot of machines do not possess. Probably the most important one, a sense of self-preservance, a motivation to maintain the own existence. Most of the robots I've come across don't have that. And to, on top of that, there's ideas such as recreation, self-sustaining, uh, functioning, and so forth. Robots don't have that. Why people refer to machines as living because in the way they move and replicate life, they look so natural that, of course, it appears as if they were living. But they do not meet the criteria of a living system. Semantics aside, some robot makers are striving to create realistic replicas of animals. This is Festo's Smart Bird, a flying robot inspired by the herring gull. 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci first tried to decode the flight of birds who can take off by using only the muscular strength of their wings. Smart Bird is the first robot that can start, fly and land autonomously with no additional drive mechanism, thanks to an active torsion in its wings. Its wingspan is close to 2 meters and yet the robot is very energy efficient. Propulsion and lift are achieved by simply flapping its wings 
and their power requirement tops at just 25 watts. Its overall weight is a mere 400 grams, thanks to the extensive use of carbon fiber in the robot's 130 components. Finally, the tail section provides control by functioning as a pitch elevator and yaw rudder, and also provides the Smartbird with additional lift. Back at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, we dive underwater to find a robot that is directly inspired by fish. It's called Naro, and it's a learning tool for young students to teach them about robotics, while at the same time illustrating the basics of marine biology. But Naro also functions as a research platform to investigate the challenges associated with building an underwater robot. There are three main challenges in creating an underwater robot. First, obviously the waterproofing. So the robot contains a lot of electronical components. They need to be safe from the water. Second, um, localization is very difficult on the water. Um, on, on, on normal ground, we can use systems like GPS to localize the robot. This is not available on the water, so it's a lot harder to know where the robot is. And the third is on the water communication. So as, as long as we're above the, the water, we can use standard techniques like wireless. Um, but this is also not available on the water, which makes it actually very hard to communicate with your robot. By overcoming these challenges, NARO could become the starting point for a new line of research into an innovative propulsion mechanism for exploration robots. In the field of underwater robotics, many um, research labs try to make the propulsion mechanism very simple, so they use just uh, simple rotating um, propellers, as we can see on, on standard um, boat motors. For our projects, we try to get inspired by biology. Fish and turtles use fins to, flapping fins to create forward motion. And we think that it's worth to analyze these types of motions to propel an underwater vehicle. The same design philosophy is shared by another aquatic robot, built at the Biorobotics Institute of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Livorno, Italy. The robot presented here is named Poseidon, and it's the first specimen of a new generation of aquatic machines differing in many ways from traditional robots. Standard underwater robots or remotely operated vehicles are composed commonly of rigid materials. They are bulky and in certain occasions they may turn out to be quite unwieldy. On the other hand, the Poseidon is composed of soft rubber-like materials, thus making the robot capable of withstanding large strains. This makes the robot especially suited for operations in cramped environments. In addition, the Poseidon sports a remarkably unconventional design, since its development was based on the inspiration, or should I say by inspiration, from the octopus. Just like the octopus, Poseidrone contracts and expands its main body to swim, expelling a ring-shaped vortex of water that enables propulsion without the use of traditional propellers. And this is not the only way that the robot can move underwater. This makes of the Poseidon the first soft robot capable of both crawling and swimming underwater. The use of soft materials inspired by natural tissues is in stark contrast to the traditional way of building robots. This new approach is called soft robotics. Soft robotics is a new paradigm of robotics where we are addressing the challenges of traditional hard robots that are more rigid, um, inherently non-soft, um, has a specific task at mind before the conception of the robot. Whereas a soft robot can change its body, change its task, depending on its environment, depending on its um, unknown task that's given to it at the last minute so that it can adapt itself not only by having an extra function, but also through its uh, mobility, through its reconfiguration of the body. This project, under development in Zurich, is called Robogami. The soft materials are manufactured like flat sheets, which can then take on any shape by using small motors based on their target function, like smart origamis. Soft robotics are a fascinating innovation that we see in robotics. By taking away the mechanical approach and allowing a more human approach, it will facilitate the creation of robots that in the way they move and in the way they react to touch will feel more natural. And to that regard will convey potentially a stronger sense of similarity 
which will facilitate interaction between humans and such devices. I guess I'm um, sort of skeptic about the soft robotics. I mean, not that there is anything illegitimate about it. It's nice if you can make the robot have round, nice edges and make it slightly better at picking up objects and stuff like that. It's good. But to me, where the action really is, is not in the robot body, but in the robot brain, the artificial intelligence part of it. I think that's ultimately where the power is going to reside, where, where the sort of, if, 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 if robots are going to become like a game changer, I think it's going to be because they become more intelligent, not, not because their fingers become slightly more subtle. I mean, even with a human who has very little of a body, say Stephen Hawkins, the physicist who is paralyzed and all, all he can sort of do is wiggle a little bit. But even with that, um, if you have sufficient thing inside of yourself, you can then be creative and you can invent things and you can communicate with other people. As long as you just have a little channel by which you can transmit information, um, I think you have what makes us essentially human. And, and, and any kind of physical incarnation on top of that is a bonus, but it's not necessary. But creating sophisticated and realistic artificial intelligence is not easy. And we might have to wait a while before we get significant results in this field. Nevertheless, even the brain is a source of inspiration for robot makers. At the Italian Institute of Technology, we find the High Brain Project, which uses a culture of natural neurons extracted from rat embryos to create a biological neural network. The neurons are able to create a novel in vitro system over the substrate embedded electrodes. This new network contains about 50 to 60,000 neurons and uh, this kind of network can survive uh, from a uh, few weeks up to months and or even uh, years. The network is then used to control a small autonomous robot. The neural network acts as a brain for the mobile robot. In particular, it receives information from its environment and processes them in order to generate motor commands for the robot so that it can drive around without hitting any uh, surrounding obstacles. When it's nearing an obstacle, the robot sends a signal to the neurons, which they use to ascertain the robot's position. When a collision happens, the frequency of the signal increases telling the neurons that something undesirable has occurred. In this way, the neurons can evolve, rearranging their configuration to avoid further impacts. Robot makers can gain useful insight on how to build adaptable machines, not just from the body, but also from the nervous system of vertebrates. This robot doesn't just imitate the morphology of the lamprey which it's modeled on, but also recreates some of the animal's instinctive behavior. Specifically, its ability to make snap decisions while swimming, as if it had some sort of sixth sense. Lamprey is a very old vertebrate. It appeared 500 million years ago. And uh, it's quite uh, simple concerning cognitive capabilities. And instead, it is able to swim and to locomote by connecting directly vision, eyes, with muscles and uh, swimming. Uh, we've done similar uh, approach in our robot by performing uh, goal-directed locomotion. Cameras are triggering muscle activation to reach a prey or to escape from a danger. The robot was designed by closely analyzing the swim biomechanics of the lamprey, which translates into a very efficient locomotion mechanism. Our lamprey robot has a flexible body and muscle-like actuators. This way, the kinetic energy uh, during locomotion can be collected in an elastic form in the body and released back, thus saving uh, amounts of energy that can be useful for improving uh, uh, autonomy. Uh, in fact, our robot is able to travel long distances with the small internal energy. The nervous system is the subject of studies in Lausanne as well, where researchers have created a robot inspired by another very old vertebrate, the salamander. 
We chose the salamander as a model animal because the salamander in some way can be considered as a living fossil. So uh, paleontologists found uh, fossilized salamanders from several tens of millions of years ago that are very similar to the current salamanders, also bigger. And uh, for this reason, uh, and as neurobiologists uh, later found in the real animal, uh, it has been considered that the spinal cord uh, locomotor networks are much simpler in the salamander than in a more evolved animal. And uh, when you want to make a neurobiological model, it's much better to begin with a simple animal than a, with a very complex one. The robot is amphibious, so it can operate both on land and in the water and go from one to the other without a hitch. This makes it valuable for reconnaissance missions after a natural disaster such as a flood. For better hydrodynamics, the legs can be removed and the robot can then perform underwater surveys, for example, testing water quality in lakes or rivers. In the same lab, we find a small terrestrial robot whose strong point is its agility. It's called Cheetah Cub. Cheetah Cub is a quadruped robot inspired by the morphology and the size of a house cat or um, a small cheetah. Its key feature are the lightweight construction, the robot weights around one kilo, and the ability to run fast. The robot can run around 1.4 meter per second on flat ground. Unlike most other quadruped robots, and to keep the weight low, Cheetah Cub does not have sophisticated onboard electronic circuitry to control its movements, but keeps its balance simply because of its morphology, just like the animals that it imitates. Cheetah Cub doesn't have any sensor, but thanks to the compliance and the mechanical design of its legs, it's capable of self-stabilizing over difficult terrain or small obstacles. Robots inspired by quadruped mammals are extremely versatile because they can operate outdoors and on different terrains. This one from Zurich is called Starleth, and it's roughly the size of a large dog. So in contrast to a lot of traditionally built stiff robots, this machine is inspired by nature. In all joints we integrate springs, which kind of resemble the way how a human or nature in general works. We have a muscle or tendon system and this is quite compliant. So for example, if a human is jogging, we store about 60% of the energy purely mechanically by stretching and releasing these tendons. Now these principles can be applied to robotics as well. So we can use these springs, uh, we can integrate them there and we can use them as energy storage. We can protect the motors so it does not get damaged by high impact loads that you have at the contact point. And we can also use them for controlling. So by controlling the springs, by regulating the um, spring compression, we actually regulate the forces that we have in these joints and this gets a compliant behavior of the system. From Italy comes HiQ, a slightly larger quadruped robot that has a different construction. Its joints are not made with springs, but they use hydraulics. According to its designers, this allows faster and smoother motion and a higher torque level. HiQ can then be used as a research platform to experiment with several different kinds of gait. The HiQ moves mainly with a trot gait, but we've also tried crawling gaits, so slower walking gaits, or faster trots. So basically what most quadrupedal animals do is first in, in, in slower speed use a walk, then do a walking trot, then do a running trot, and later do a gallop. We have done bounding motions where the hind legs and the front legs uh, work one after the other. We have done this in simulation, but not yet on the robot. And what we can try as well is a pace gait. For example, giraffes with the very long legs, they need to move the, the left and the right pair uh, one after the other, because otherwise the long legs would touch each other. Walking on four legs is a very stable configuration, but some animals, like apes, can alternate it with bipedal locomotion. That's exactly what this robot, called Charlie, can do. Charlie is a reactive system and inspired by chimps. Uh, by a reactive system, I mean that the robot is able to walk on, on a certain surface, also with small obstacles, and can react on these obstacles to stay stable uh, at all the time. The robot is inspired by the chimps um, because the chimps um, show us a, a broad range of motion possibilities. So the apes can walk on uh, four legs, also on three or on two. 
uh, and we try to, um, to copy these motion patterns also with our ape that uh, the robot will be able to walk also on four and on two legs. Charlie belongs to the iStruct project, developed in Bremen by the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, to create semi-autonomous robotic systems for space exploration. A robot like this could work on the surface of the moon, a portion of which has been recreated in the lab for testing. Charlie's flexible spine makes it particularly suitable for negotiating lunar craters. Unlike most robotic systems, Charlie has six degrees of freedom in his spine. So this means we uh, don't have a rigid connection between the front and the rear body. We also implemented a lot of force sensors into the spine. This means um, that we can now control the um, flow of forces within the system and this allows us to implement new control behaviors for the robot. Its foot is also special. We integrated 57 sensors directly into the foot um, and added also uh, local electronics to read all the sensor data. Um, with these sensors and the, the electronics, we can apply uh, control algorithms to the system, uh, which wouldn't be possible if we haven't had all the sensors. Flexibility is also the main feature of this astonishing robot developed by Festo, the bionic kangaroo. By recreating the unique anatomy of the jumping marsupial, it can recover energy during the landing phase, store it, and use it for the next jump. In this way, the animal and the robot can both accelerate without increasing their energy consumption. Jumping power is provided by a pneumatic system using compressed air, while an electric motor takes care of additional motion. Interestingly, the robot is controlled with gestures by wearing an armband. Thanks to its lightweight construction, the robot only weighs about 7 kilos and stands at about a meter tall. It can jump 40 centimeters high and up to a distance of 80 centimeters. The robot is not designed to be a functional end product, but rather to stimulate further research in biomimetics, to promote the use of energy recovery systems in robots, and to intelligently combine pneumatics and electrics. Looking at nature is therefore helping us build machines that are more efficient, more adaptable and more innovative. But research in bio-inspired robots can also have other, maybe unexpected, benefits. Robotics uh, is a very uh, wide field. Actually, people think of the robot like a machine moving rigidly uh, on the floor. But actually, this is not true. I mean, the real vision is that uh, all sciences converge into robotics. Uh, just think through uh, the new materials to make the robot soft and compliant. These are typically polymeric materials or bio-inspired materials. Just think to robots that uh, move into the body uh, to collect images or to uh, deliver drugs. Uh, this has to do a lot with the medical sciences and you need to know um, anatomy, you need to have propulsion systems, uh, you, you need to have uh, uh, biochemistry uh, very well known and very well controllable uh, to make the robot functional. Uh, and just think to the humanoid or the animaloid, uh, in these robots you have a combination of brain science, biomechanics, uh, materials, so you really need a very cross-disciplinary approach uh, to make a robot uh, of the last generation. Actually, the most interesting example, it could be the plantoid. I mean, plants are normally considered as uh, immobile systems. We see the plant standing there forever. But actually, underground roots are moving very fast and they move in a very smart way because roots have sensors uh, capable of detecting the pH, the hardness or the salinity. So uh, the roots move and grow in the direction which is more convenient to the sustainability of the plant itself. Now copying a plant, making a plantoid, so making a, a robotic plant, means investigating the world of uh, vegetable life science, understanding the, the way roots propagate and grow, and in principle uh, this gives solutions not only now for uh, agronomic studies, agriculture, plant studies, but also for the future. Uh, just imagine a satellite that lands on a surface of planets we don't know, and we don't know anything about the stability, the equilibrium. So this satellite will land on the planet, 
will take out routes and the routes will autonomously find the best situation to balance the satellite and keep it stable on this unknown planet surface. So this is why robotics is much more than conventional robotics as it's meant today. The goal of this research is double. From one side, we want to develop a new robots inspired by the movement and behavior of plant roots in order to use in different scenarios and applications. But on the other hand, we want to use a plantoid as a platform, as a tool in the hand of the expert in order to better understand the features related to the mo model that we study. So, plant roots. In particular, we want to understand how plant root feel and perceive the environment and adapt their behavior consequently. By developing bio-inspired robots, engineers can sometimes discover new things also at a biological level. This was the case for us of our jumping robot. The animal model is a tiny insect, Cicadella viridis, uh, which jumps uh, uh, in 5 milliseconds. And we discovered that during jumping, Cicadella is able to modulate the force exchanged between the feet and the ground. This force is kept at a safe level, not exceeding the um, resistance of legs and substrate, but also at a high level, so it's actually kept constant. We published these results on a biological journal, the Journal of Experimental Biology, and uh, uh, the main finding is that the neural system is not able to modulate this force in the time needed for jumping, that are just 5 milliseconds, but there is another mechanism able to modulate this force. This mechanism is the kinematics of the legs, the geometry, the morphology, of the legs that are mapping a muscular force which is typically non-constant into a constant force at the feet ground interface. Robots then can help unveil secrets about the animals they mimic, but they can also work as experimental models, reducing the need to perform experiments on animals. In order to understand how a biological system works, biologists often perform experiments on animals. With biomimetic robots, it is possible in some cases to substitute animals with a robot. For example, uh, concerning neuroscientific hypothesis, instead of performing an animal experiment, it is possible to program a robot and to observe the behavior of the robot. If the behavior is compatible with the natural observation, then the hypotheses are right, otherwise new uh, theories have to be developed. There are more studies now using robots as controlled physical models, especially in terms of mechanics and dynamics, to study uh, the real biological systems. Uh, in the past, uh, there has been studies on lizard or um, uh, octopus, that used uh, uh, robots, and I try to extend that to uh, spiders. This is Salamandra Robotica 2, and it's a robot we have developed to test neurobiological model. What it's important to know here is that the, um, in all vertebrates, the loco all the rhythmic locomotion is controlled by the spinal cord. So the, the brain will send very simple signals to the spinal cord and the spinal cord generates all the rhythmic signals to control the muscles. And uh, the idea with this robot is to use it to test the neurobiological models that we've developed in collaboration with neurobiologists to test if they work also in the reality and not only in a simulation in a computer. From the air to the water, from difficult terrain to underground, from flexible structures to soft materials, robots have a lot to learn from biological systems and they can even give something back to other branches of science. By using nature as a model for robots, robots are now helping us to understand nature. A robot can be a tool for scientific discovery because a robot can be a simplified model of a natural process that occurs in the world. 
and by trying to build a model, we learn about the process because we're trying to overcome the challenges that are associated with mimicking the process, thereby learning the inner workings of the process. So to that regard, trying to recreate something in nature with a robot can be a great tool for scientific discovery, as any theoretical model can be a great tool for scientific discovery. And I wouldn't go so far as to say, well, we're trying to create life. That's not the goal. The goal is to understand the processes that unfold in nature by trying to replicate them.